Hello, and welcome to another episode of Byzantium and Friends. I am Anthony, your host. This is the last episode I will be posting in 2021, which was not a very good year. Let's hope for better ones. We can do better. Right now we're being menaced by another Greek letter. For the record, in Greek it's pronounced Omicron. In English you can pronounce it as Omicron. I've heard all kinds of variations. Anyway, I hope your plans for the winter break weren't too compromised by it. Now on to our topic for today. Sometimes it is easier to see a thing better from the margins than when you're inside it, or to understand it better from the problem cases rather than, you know, the normative ones. And I'm thinking specifically of the Roman Empire, which is what we're going to be talking about today in the context of, you know, late antiquity, roughly the 6th century. The Roman Empire is, for many of us, the archetype of an empire. It's kind of the template on which we think about empire, whether we are historians or political scientists or writing novels or film. And and that's the case throughout a large part of the Western world. Yet in certain important ways, the Roman Empire is studied very differently from other empires, perhaps more recent ones for which we have more documentation, that are seen much more through the lens of historical research and Um, national histories. And what makes the Roman Empire different in one decisive respect is the role that classics plays in it. That is a discipline that valorizes texts in Greek and Latin and treats them as as a prized literary heritage, which they are, not doubting that. But when you conflate the Roman Empire with the Greco Latin literary heritage, you miss a lot. And in particular, you miss a lot about what makes the Roman Empire an empire. That is the fact that this one group of people or organization, the the Roman res publica or imperium or whatever, through force of arms, conquered all of these other people around the Mediterranean, right, from, from Britain to Syria, and subjected them to various regimes of domination and exploitation, at least in the short term. The nature of those prized Greek and Latin texts is such that they give us a perspective of that process largely from the point of view of the conquerors. Now, to be sure, the Greek states and cities of the East were also conquered by the Romans, and so we do get a glimpse of the experience of conquest from the Greek perspective, certainly, but most of the texts that we have from the empire are written by people, you know, Greek speakers who had one way or another come to terms with the Roman Empire or were actually part of its ruling elite and were generally very comfortable with it. Um, they uh, identified more with the uh, um, you know, Latin uh, speaking aristocracy in Rome than with conquered populations of, you know, Egyptian-speaking peasants in Egypt or Aramaic speakers in Syria and so forth. So the approach to the Roman Empire through its literary production in Greek and Latin poses those kinds of limitations to what we can see and what questions are put on the table for study. Now, from a very different direction, There was, in the decades after World War II, and especially during the period of decolonization of most of the world uh, today, um, there emerged strains of scholarship which looked at the empire through an explicitly, um, you know, to modern colonial or post-colonial perspective. And they were looking for ways in which the Roman Empire could be described in modern terms and specifically in terms of the resistance of local populations to Roman hegemony. And this kind of scholarship emerged, for example, in the context of the brutal French occupation of North Africa and the wars of resistance there. And that experience, like in the in the 50s in particular, created an expectation that, like, Whenever we see violence or resistance to any kind of authority in, say, the province of North Africa, that that has to be understood in terms of resistance to Rome. And 
Similar kinds of phenomena could perhaps be seen in, say, Egypt, but very clearly documented in the case of certain uh, Jewish wars of resistance against the Romans, especially in the first and early second centuries uh, AD. Now, I don't have the sense that that approach is very prevalent today. That kind of thinking pretty much burned itself out. It's difficult to interpret many of those phenomena as resistance to Rome, like some sort of anti-colonial war of liberation or what what. For the most part, it's kind of mutated into scholarship that examines local diversity throughout the Roman Empire. That's not assuming that Roman no- norms and you know modes were automatically just kind of imposed everywhere or accepted by everybody, and that the Roman Empire was uh, uniform in you know in its culture and political loyalties and so on. But just kind of assuming that there was a lot going on and it took very many different shapes locally, and there were lots of languages and different cultures and so on, even if they didn't act out in like post-colonial wars of liberation. Now, one very particular corner of the scholarly world works on Syriac texts that is produced by Syriac-speaking communities in Syria, Palestine. Uh, Syriac is a word that we use to describe late Aramaic. It's the same language. And this area of study has a particular inflection, which is that its texts, so Syriac literature, is predominantly, overwhelming, almost exclusively uh, produced by the Syrian Orthodox Church. That is a church that developed as a separate kind of institution starting slowly in the 6th century, picking up speed after the Arab conquest, and distinguished itself from the uh, Imperial Church of Byzantium, which accepted the Council of Chalcedon, The Syrian Orthodox Church did not accept the Council of Chalcedon. There were some minor, I think, theological differences there, but people insisted on them very much, and it produced a split. And so there was a separate church that um, developed a kind of separate identity during the Arab conquest and its own literature. And that is the sort of home base for a lot of, um, for many scholars who study Uh, Syriac speakers, both in late antiquity and during the Islamic period. Now, as it happens, in the later phases of the history of this church, especially in the 12th 12th century, uh, with an author, a a historian, um, Michael the Syrian, or Michael the Great, uh, writing in Syriac in the 12th century. Uh, He was also a bishop in this church. And his worldview by that point was very much you know, we, the Orthodox Christian community, he, meaning the Syrian Orthodox Church, are very separate and distinct from the Romans by, you know, like the Byzantine Imperial Church, or that, what we would call it. And so that polarity has sometimes been read back into texts of the late Roman period, like even of the 6th century. And it has created sometimes this paradigm where Syriac speakers are understood to be in some kind of adversarial relation with Rome or like the the official church of Constantinople uh, with which they disagreed. And so we still kind of end up in a paradigm of resistance. In post-colonial studies, such a population might qualify for the term subaltern, which is a technical term for uh, populations that are generally on the conquered side in an imperial relationship um, who have to at least outwardly play by the rules of the dominant uh, power and yet who's re- who retain their own language, their own culture, in this case a religion that sees itself in an adversarial relationship to that of the dominant power. But this, as we will see today, was not necessarily the case. This impression was likely produced in the centuries after the Arab conquests of the 7th century. When we look back to the 5th and 6th centuries, what we find in Syriac texts is something quite different. That relationship had not yet played out. It had not resulted in a definitive split. And we find Syriac authors replicating many of the same modes and orders and tropes that we find in Greek and Latin authors. And in some very interesting instances, they will 
refer to themselves as we Romans. In other words, there is a case to be made for Syriac inflected Romanness in the same way that a case can be made for Greek inflected Romanness. So Romans could speak Greek, they could speak Latin, they could speak Syriac in, in this environment of the later Roman Empire in the 6th century. My guest today has made precisely such a case for one very important 6th century Syriac author, a man we conventionally call John of Ephesus, rather anglicizes his name a little bit. We'll talk about that in the episode. He wrote a number of works, uh, primarily a church history and a number of saints' lives. And a good case can be made that in these works, he is being just as much a Roman as anyone writing in Greek at the same time, like Procopius, or writing in Latin, like Justinian. Uh, Justinian, a, an emperor with whom he had uh, very tight dealings. My guest is Hartmut Leppen, who is a professor of ancient history at the Goethe University of Frankfurt uh, in Germany. Um, he is a leading ancient historian, uh, especially of late antiquity. He has written among the best studies of the reigns of Theodosius I and of Justinian um, and many other works on early Christianity and late antiquity generally. Now, in addition, Hartmut is a fascinating and rare case of an ancient historian with, you know, its traditional classics background who learns Syriac in order to be able to use Syriac texts for precisely these kinds of historical questions and not primarily in order to study the history of anti-Chalcedonian theology or the evolution of the Syrian Orthodox Church, uh, but to see Roman society um, and sort of the literary cadres of Roman society in a fuller picture, one that is informed by all of the languages that historians can potentially uh, have available to them if they bother to learn them. And by the way, many of these Syriac texts are also translated into either English or French, so they are accessible. You just have to you know, make the effort to go look there and not assume that there's something foreign or different or you know, not... Uh, closely entwined with the Greek and Latin texts of the period, because they were. Okay, I'll stop there. Uh, many thanks to Medievalist.net for reposting these episodes. Uh, without any further delay, here's my conversation with Hartmut. Hartmut, welcome to the podcast. Hello, Anthony. So I'm very happy to speak with you about the topic that we have today. Let me first note for the benefit of the audience that you are a a very prolific historian of the late Roman world. And among many other works, you have written what I regard as the standard histories of the reign of Theodosius I and of the age of Justinian. Uh, and your books about those are better than those that we have in English. <laughs> so I hope that your books are translated into English soon. Those two particular ones, I find them very useful. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about a topic on which you wrote just an article in a volume, but I think that the topic is very important. And, uh, you know, rather than talk about Theodosius or Justinian very generally, I want to talk about this intersection of the Roman world and the Syriac speaking world, which is what your article is about, focusing in particular on, on John of Ephesus, a sixth century character we'll, we'll talk about. But I want to use the opportunity to make some broader observations about that intersection and, and about where we situate Syriac studies in the field of Roman studies, assuming that it is a one is part of the other. I don't know, but they might be independent. Uh, so let's just start with some basic uh, scene setting. Uh, can you tell us about you know, who, who are we talking about? Where was Syriac spoken in the Eastern Roman provinces? By whom and so forth? Yes, Syriac is not the language of modern Syria but an Aramaic dialect. Aramaic was a very old, widely used language of the Middle East. And one standardized literary form of Aramaic is Syriac. It was developed in Edessa, which is today Shaliofa in Southeast Turkey, which on the other hand belonged to the historical region of Syria. It's a bit confusing, I have to confess. Mm. The language was used in this region, in Syria, in Palestine, even beyond the Roman borders down into Iraq, Iran, even India. There were many native speakers, but it was also important as a lingua franca, like English today in this region. Um, as in many societies today, we 
can meet in this region many people who were bilingual, who knew more than one language. Um, and in this sense, you would meet in many places people who knew Syriac. We don't have exact numbers about Syriac speakers, but it was an important language used by many people. Right. So, I mean, I've read estimates of the demography of the Roman Empire that put the population of, you know, broader Roman Syria at, you know, roughly about, including Palestine, you know, roughly about 5 million people. Um, so would it be fair to say that probably the majority of people in, you know, from Syria down to Egypt spoke that Aramaic? In my impression, many of them spoke Aramaic dialects, so they would understand Syriac speakers. But um, I think more important than the number of Aramaic or Syriac native speakers was the probably high number of people who had learned Syriac as well. Okay. There were also so, Arabic speaking people in this region. Ah, uh, yes, of course. Yes, we also have Arabic languages. Um, so do we know people who were, let's say, native speakers of Syriac, but who had also learned Greek? And what about the reverse, native Greek speakers who had learned Syriac? Interestingly, many Syriac speakers knew Greek, even wrote Greek quite well. But there are very few native Greek speakers who knew Syriac. Some of them will really have understood Syriac. But I do not know of any native Greek speaker who wrote in Syriac. Whereas we have people right. who were born in a Syriac context who wrote Greek. One of them might have been Lucian. Right, of uh, course. Satirist. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought that um, Theodoret, the Bishop of Cyrus, might have been a native Syriac speaker, or at least understood it, but who wrote mostly or entirely in Greek. Probably yes. At least he knew both languages. He could communicate could communicate in both languages. Yeah. As probably several bishops could. Another mm, case in point might have been Rabud of Edessa, right. who knew Syriac, who was able to speak in Constantinople. He would have spoken Greek for this occasion, but we don't know for sure. Okay. So just to clear up some confusion about the names by which this language is called. <laughs> so in some contexts, it's called Aramaic. In some contexts, it's called Syriac. Then there are references to all these dialects of Syriac. Uh, other scholars talk about um, Christian Palestinian Aramaic. And so my understanding is that these are all basically the same language with some minor regional differences or regional uh, differences in the conventions about how you spell certain things, maybe some minor grammatical differences, but it's just pretty much the same language. They were very, very similar. And the Syriac speakers were proud of Jesus who spoke yeah. a form of Aramaic, Galilean Aramaic, to put it this way. Yes. And they could understood um, the words, the Aramaic words um, Jesus uses in the Gospels. Right. And they... For this reason, they saw Syriac as the truly Christian language. Not Greek, not Hebrew, but Syriac was the true Christian language. For them. Um, that's a point. <laughs> they get that point. I... <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so there's another thing about the what, what scholars call the Syriac language that we also have to acknowledge, which is that it is, at least in, a, in much of the scholarship, tied to the rejection of the Council of Chalcedon, the 451, and is associated with sort of anti-Chalcedonian uh, movements, uh, which later in Byzantium would be considered, would be called Monophysite, right? But, now let's not get into all of the theological controversies, mm -hmm. but it does seem that modern study of the Syriac uh, literary corpus is very much um, you know, working within the history of the anti-Chalcedonian movement. But to what degree, if we were to be uh, in the fifth or sixth century, to what degree was Syriac identified as a language for uh, channeling anti-Chalcedonian movement? In other words, do these two things overlap or is that a product of later developments? 
I think it's mainly a product of later developments as the whole impression we have of ancient Syria um, depends on the question of trans transmission of texts. We also have some very few pagan texts written in Syria. Mm. We have translations of porphyry in Syria. We have sentence of Menander in Syria. We have a stoic philosophical treatise of Syria, but made most texts we know today are Christian texts. And many, most of them are Miaphysite texts. But interestingly, at the beginning of the sixth century, the Bishop Severus of Antiochus, Antioch, the Bishop Severus of Antioch, who was a famous theologian um, of the Miaphysite doctrine, wrote in Greek. Nevertheless, his works have been transmitted in Syria. And this shows how the Miaphysite tradition was ever more connected with Syriac as a language, which was not the case during the sixth century. Right. Yeah. So there is an element of, of filtering there and of reception, um, which, by the way, for everyone listening, the, the same works for Byzantium as well. Like later on, yeah. the Byzantine tradition, right, in, in deciding which Greek text to preserve. So, for mm -hmm. example, filtered out all of the, let's say, Aryan literature, all of the anti-Chalcedonian literature, leaving us with a rather monolithic sort of orthodox tradition as seen later on. And, and so that would not be a reason to conclude that, you know, well, Greek speakers were all, you know, anti-Aryan and anti-Chalcedonian, no. So there's an element of, of the shaping of the literary corpus by later tradition. Um, okay, so let's talk about the politics of the language study today, um, as it were. And, and I say this because a few generations ago, even a few decades ago, it would have been quite rare, very uncommon for a Roman historian to decide to learn Syriac for the purposes of historical research. So let's assume you're not working on the history of the anti-Chalcedonians right in the East, but you're just a Roman historian, like, like you are working on a broad range of topics and you learn Syriac. So why was it so uncommon and what's changed today? So like, why did you do it? I think um, one of the main reasons is that classical studies have been connected with a certain idea of classical culture, which was connected to the languages of the Greeks and the Romans. Greek and Latin were the classical languages. And as until at least the mid of the 20th century, there was also a normative concept connected with these studies. They systematically excluded other languages as for example, Hebrew and Syriac. Whereas theologians, um, used to learn Syriac because the texts were so important, but they didn't, were not interested in the historical studies. One of the main figures who reminded historians of the importance of Syriac was Peter Brown, who was immensely influential in this regard, who encouraged many people to learn Syriac. I personally was encouraged by a student in Berlin who came from Syria and to live in this Syria Christian tradition, it would told me a lot about those interesting texts. And so I started learning Syria mm -hmm. from starting from this motive. And as far as, can, uh, as far as I can see, most people who use Syria for the historic studies have some personal motivations. It is not good for the career, at least in Germany. <laughs> you know, Syria, it's regarded as peripheral. Still, okay. um, and therefore it needs a lot of encouragement of young students, of doctoral students to make them learn Syriac, which can be so important. Right. So you see, your training was a sort of standard classical ancient historian, right? Yes. Like, right. Mm. And, and, and you added that on your own initiative. Yes. Well, I hope that in the U.S. at least the, I mean, the disciplinary boundaries aren't quite so hard and fast. I mean, I know that in Europe I sometimes think, they yeah. are. I think so, yes. Yeah, and so in I Germany, see mm, in many students history, in the US. Yeah, in Germany, we, te we train ancient, uh, sorry. In Germany, we train, we mainly train teachers for school. And those are expected to teach the classical themes such as Pericles and Augustus, which is much more important than any late antique, strange Christian right. figure. I see. 
Right. So there is a there's a sort of pet, a pedagogy and a, a career and pedagogy component to it. Yes. Right. Um, a classicistic undercurrent, which is not very intensely reflected. Yeah, I see. So as a Roman historian, what advantages would you say you've derived from your knowledge of Syriac? What do those texts give you that either you don't find in the Greek and Latin texts or that supplement it in interesting ways? The first thing is simply some basic information I find in these texts about certain events. This is not very interesting, but important in many respects. The second thing is that you get a completely different perspective when you start immersing in those texts. Because we have, especially in the case of John of Ephesus, whom you mentioned, we have a kind of voice from someone who was among the victims of the religious policy of Justinian, who suffered a lot from this policy. And on the other hand, he came from a region that was deeply connected with the Persian world. The people had context beyond the Roman Empire, and therefore the perspective on the Roman Empire changes completely if you start reading Syriac. Right. On the other hand, you see the impact of the Roman Empire in the language, since they used many, many Greek loan words, especially for political institutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the aspect that interests me the most. It kind of fascinates me, which is that all of this population of Syriac speakers were not only inhabitants of the empire, but also its citizens after, you know, the third century, all, all free people were citizens. And so they had to kind of get by as Romans, you know, within this mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. And I'm, so since my work focuses so much on how Greek speakers adapted to Roman institutions and ways of doing things and thinking, and how did the Greek language change to adapt itself to Roman to, to, you know, being the, the, the language of the Roman world in, in, in later Byzantium. So it intrigues me how Syriac might have done so. Um, and that we didn't focus only on Greek. There were other languages that made these adjustments mm -hmm. too. And so, yeah, that's the, uh, the part of the story that intrigues me the most. And I, I have a, a graduate student who just finished uh, Jimmy Wolf um, and, and he's, he learned Syriac and he's, his dissertation was on, you know, aspects of this uh, topic, and I, I hope he does more work um, on this. Uh, I think that Roman historians need to be sensitized more uh, to what was mm -hmm. going on in all of these provinces. Um, now, on the, the flip side um, is that there has long been a tradition of, of study of Syriac by scholars who are interested in the, you know, confessional history of the Syrian Orthodox Church, uh, which in some older bibliography is called uh, Jacobite. Mm -hmm. uh, any other names? Uh, Monophysite. <laughs> it's got yes, a number of names. Anti-Chalcedonians. Anti there are many, many names. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I get the sense that that body of scholarship is not so much interested in the broader questions posed by, you know, how these people lived in the Eastern Roman provinces, but simply and strictly in the, his the confessional history of that uh, religious community. Um, and so um, there's, it seems it's a great body of, the, or most of the scholarship on Syriac texts is sort of much more theologically oriented, or am I getting that wrong? Yeah, that's true. And uh, many of the theologians did also the basic word work of editing texts, of identifying texts. So they right. did something fundamental, but their interest was focused on detecting certain theological ideas, they often were fascinated by the intensity of the beliefs and the convictions. Perhaps I met, might add something to your, the first point you made. I think I often meet among my students a misunderstanding, which can be, we have derived from the modern national state that they think that a state should have an official language. Germany has German, French, France has French, and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. And so they automatically think that the Romans must have spoken Latin and must have forced the people to mm -hmm. speak Latin. And they ignore the fact that there was no official language, that Greek was respected and could develop. But there were also these other questions, Coptics, uh, languages, Coptic, Hebrew, Syriac, other forms of um, 
of Aramaic, Ikaonian, and so on and so on that could exist. And therefore, this strong connection, connection between state and language is something that makes us misunderstand antiquity, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it's so important to stress the multilingual multilinguality of the ancient Roman Empire, which became even more palpable through the Christianization of the empire. Yes, and I think to a degree it was possible to interact on an official bureaucratic level with the Roman authorities in Syriac especially in a city like Edessa. I mean, I, yes. I think that, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, a lot of the groundwork must mm -hmm. have been done in the local language. And, you know, once it, if there was any need for the, the matter at hand to jump to the more imperial level, it was translated into Latin or Greek or, or whatever. Uh, but yeah, it it's, it, it's fascinating to think about all of these local Roman operations taking place in Syria. And you can see it sometimes in the, like the, um, the translation of some of the acts of the uh, Council of Ephesus too, right? Isn't it? With, mm -hmm. And they have all of these acclamations that, mm -hmm. but they're translated into Syriac. And and these are mm -hmm. the people of, I think it's Edessa, right? And they're just acclaiming the governor and long live Rom Romania and all of this in Syria. Anyway, um, oh, great, great. Um, so let's talk about our case study here, John of Ephesus. Um, can you tell us just the, the basic background about his life and writings? Mm -hmm. Yes, what we perceive as facts on li John's life is mainly deduced from his own writings, which may cast some doubts upon certain details, but we can be pretty sure that John was born in Ingula in the north of Amida, which is today Diyarbakir, again, Southeast Turkey, he became famous during the Iraq war, I think. Mm -hmm. He was born in about 507 and was destined to become a monk from his childhood which was often the case in these worlds. And he grew up in a world where Mephysitism began to establish a church of its own, but under difficult circumstances. The monks of the community he belonged to were forced into exile um, for a decade. And on his travels, he made, he met admirable ascetics. But he did not feel himself to be strong enough to follow their example. So he didn't stay, didn't remain a monk, but he became a priest, deacon first, a priest then. And interestingly, from about 540, John lived in Constantinople, although officially Miaphysites like him, people like him, were persecuted by the emperor. But there were even some Miaphysite bishops in the palace mm. of Justinian who could talk with them and control them. John was not in a palace, but lived in a suburb of Constantinople, where he met many people, <coughs> among them courteous, um, influential people from the city of um, Constantinople. And so he had a relatively free life in an officially persecuting society. He and Justinian seem to have found a kind of modus vivendi and got along relatively well. Justinian's successor, Justinian II, tried to establish a unified Christian church with Miaphysites and Diophysites, and also reached out to John who tried to support the emperor, but in the end, the whole endeavor failed. And this was something very problematic for John because many of his co-religionists saw him as a traitor. Right. In my opinion, he wrote the church history also to prove that he was a real Miaphysite mm. who had personally suffered for his beliefs. We do not exactly when he died, the last things he mentions belongs to the reign of um, Mauritius to the end of the 6th century, 588. He would have died soon afterwards, sometime afterwards. Right, and what were his main writings? The church history and the lives of the Oriental saints. So these are this saints is... of his religious community? Yes, yes. Yeah. 
real heroes of asceticism. Yeah, yeah. M- many of them who suffered and were persecuted by the Chalcedonian, the official Chalcedonian Church of Constantinople, that would mean Justin the First and Justinian, Justin the Second. So, yeah, but some of them even challenged the emperor successfully. He describes yeah. them as coming to the imperial court, um, chiding the emperor aggressively and doing miracles on the emperor who grew a kind of tumor on his head <laughs> as the result of the attack of a monk. And so they were small people, very often they are described as small people, as dirty people who were powerful nevertheless. They are despised yeah. by the elites, but they break in and bring their word in a very powerful way to Constantinople and to the palace itself. Right, well, yeah, on a certain level, you're you're safer in the palace, even if you disagree with the emperor's policies, <laughs> yes. than you would be in the eastern provinces where his officials can just beat you up and nobody cares. But this is true. This is true. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, in the palace, there was also Theodora, who had right. sympathy with the Miaphysites. Yeah, yeah. So you know, Procopia says that she and Justinian were playing both sides against each other, right? It's kind of a yes. divide and mm-hmm. conquer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, what do you think about that? I mean, what role do you think Theodora was playing in that uh, tense dynamic? I think it was a very smart idea to have these different positions at the court, since she was always able to communicate with the Miaphysites, and she could perform the role, the typical role of imperial women at this time, that she asked Justinian to act more mildly mm. um, in reference to the Miaphysites. This was her role. And so there was somebody in the palace the Miaphysites could trust on. And there was somebody the Chalcedonians could trust on. And I think, I think it's true that they at least performed the roles of being of diverse, different confessions. Right. Yeah. I mean, even if you're attacking a group, it's still good to have some channels of communication with it somehow. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so here we have a situation. So we have an author, uh, John of Ephesus, who, who is from the Eastern provinces. He speaks a language that is not, you know, one of the languages used officially by the Roman state. And he is part of a persecuted religious minority. And so with those facts, we might want to consider him, you know, in light of sort of subaltern colonial theory, right? Like this, he's representing the, the, this kind of unicorn that ancient historians are looking for, which is uh, someone who's being oppressed by imperial power, but can actually, you know, speak and represent his position. Um, and you're, you know, while acknowledging that your study of him sort of pushes back against that. Uh, a little bit. John of Ephesus is not exactly a subaltern voice. Um, So why not? What is it about him that, you know, doesn't make him representative of like oppressed groups throughout the Roman Empire? Um, To a degree, it's true that he represented oppressed groups. But what is very important in his case is that he was loyal to the Roman state as such. He didn't see any alternative to the Roman Empire. Not even the Persian Empire was an alternative in his view. Um, there was, uh, they had no Christian rulers and they had a, a Christian minority, but this minority was from his viewpoint still more radical than the Chalcedonians. Mm. He called them Nestorians. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there were heretics who were close to the Persian Empire. And therefore, he was a Roman who despised barbarians, who was against um, the Persians, and whose dream it was to be, in the end, the main advisor of the emperor. But it would cause mere physicism orthodoxy in the waiting. And if they had been successful, he could have performed this role. And he even imagines this role in his own work. There's a famous anecdote where he claims that he converted thousands of pagans in Asia Minor on the request and with funding by the emperor. 
I do not believe it. It's a minority position. Most of my colleagues do believe it. I think it's an idealistic picture to show what could happen if only Justinian, the legitimate Roman ruler, were smart enough to follow the advice of John of Ephesus and use him as his supporter. Right, I remember reading that article too. I mean, it, it is pretty radical. Um, and, you know, <laughs> I think one of the reasons why th there's reluctance to read his account that way is because he provides data. He, yes. He gives numbers of the number of people converted, the number of temples destroyed, the number of churches. And we has, we love data. It's so rare that we can find some data. And you're now coming along and saying, no, that's not real data. You can't use that data. I, I don't know. I, anyway, and, and I don't know if he was being, uh, you know, really uh, tricky that way, because uh, even when you're going to make up or greatly embellish an account, one way to make it convincing is to give sort of very exact numbers because then it looks like, oh, he's got circumstantial detail and like, oh, we must believe it. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so there's no reason to think that he was, how should I put this, that he suffered any kind of particular disadvantage as a person because his native language was Syriac. That doesn't seem to have impeded his ability to access the court and, you know, find supporters and move at the highest levels. And insofar as he belonged to a, um, I don't want to say minority religious group, because in the East, it was the majority in many places, but one that was being targeted by the imperial authorities, it wasn't because of his language or where he was. I mean, there were plenty of Greek speakers and speakers of other languages that were suffered the same fate. And so it, it, that I think this is part of the reason why, you know, Syriac speaker plus anti-Chalcedonian does not make you like necessarily a subaltern voice in the Roman Empire. He moved in very high circles. Mm. And exactly like you said, I mean, he, he displays many of the attitudes of, you know, Greek and Latin writers of that time. And as you said, with regard to Persia, the role of the emperor and all of that, he just wanted the emperor to be on his side rather than the other side. Um, so, but nevertheless, he did spend quite a bit of time in, in prison, uh, and he wrote part of the ecclesiastical history there. Mm -hmm. um, so this would make it one of the rare specimens of prison literature, right, from the Roman Empire. Yes, this is a fascinating observation. There's Boethius in the sixth century who wrote in prison. There is a um, not very famous poet, Racontius, who wrote some of his poems under vendor rulers in prison and in i do not really know why this is the case so often but there's another case famous case of prison literature these are the epistles of paul paul of tarsus the apostle he mm. set an example how oh. people can have a an important role can have parousia as he says is free of speed in the prison because he is in prison because this existence in prison shows that he is a true believer, that he is willing to suffer for God. And I could imagine that this background of Paul made it even interesting for Christians to write in prison. Interesting. Huh. They gained a lot of authority by this, I think. It's a guess. I should, um, I have to go much more into it. But this, uh, this example of Paul is fascinating. Yeah, I'd be interested to read uh, more about this if you develop that idea. Um, by the way, something else occurred to me now, now that we're talking about like John of Ephesus's identity, um, I've long been troubled by the way we refer to him as John of Ephesus in a way that I think it kind of effaces his cultural distinctiveness. John mm -hmm. is an English name. This is not what his name was. It was something like Yuhanan or something, right? Yes. And Ephesus also makes him look a bit more classical it was mm -hmm. so Ephesus was the city of which he was nominally the you know myophysite bishop I don't know that he went there very much or at all um Probably not yeah Only I, rare, at all yeah he was from you know Amida which is mm -hmm. much less sort of classical or familiar to classical historians mm -hmm. so Yohanan of Amida is a sort of seems like a different kind of figure than John of Ephesus who seems very mm -hmm. you know I don't know, should we be highlighting the difference here or, or playing it down? Because I can see arguments for both. He himself called um, himself John of Asia, Asia 
Asia. Um, but that points of to Ephesus. The of Asia in the end. So he also accepted mm. this um, Roman word. Mm. Um, I think it would make sense to call him John of Amida because this difference becomes very clear. If I mention John of Ephesus for a group of classical journalists, they somehow think of um, the author of the Gospels. They have mm. other ideas. They want to find something normal, mm -hmm. somebody normal, to put it this way. And John of Amida would make clear that there is a problem and it's not so easy. Yeah, I, and I would like to find some way to recognize his native language. Um, in, in part because, yeah, I mean, as a Byzantinist, I'm, I don't like the Anglicization of Byzantine names uh, or even their Latinization. I, I just don't see the point for that anymore. Uh, but, uh, and, and I would like to see the same kinds of con considerations of, sort of cultural distinctiveness and identity mm -hmm. to pass on to Syriac uh, writers and, and whatever. I mean, I know this can't be done. Uh, you know, absolutely, you know, there are always exceptions in odd cases. But anyway, that just occurred to me. So, okay, let's go back to his writings. And uh, so he, we have these uh, saints' lives, and we have the ecclesiastical history, and they're written in Syriac. Is there anything distinctively Syriac, other than the language, about these works? Or are they following in the sort of framework of Greek and Latin works of the same genres. They would say, even say they deliberately take up the classical genres. The church history refers back to Eusebius. He obviously knew the other church historians, Sosom and Theodoret, Socrates. And um, he wants to show that he is able to continue this tradition. And um, it's a typical, if we had only in Greek translations, translation, we wouldn't feel that this is a Syriac work. The only thing, mm. thing which would make this clear would be the fact that he refers much more to the East. Sure. But Theodoret refers very much to the East too. Yeah. And Sosomen has many details about the Holy Land, about Palestine. And so um, the regional identity is not a problem as such. The lives of the saints are very similar to the Historia Religiosa, the lives of saints written by Theodoret. We already mentioned. There are sometimes there are people mm. who say, yes, there was a specific, specific oriental radicalism, something like <laughs> this. But these are the classical and listed attitudes to authors of this kind. Right. Yeah, no, I, my intellectual defenses go up every time I hear something like, like this, like, mm. you know, the, well, the moral qualities that we see in this work are, yeah. yeah. Um, so at this time, there are many Greek works that are being translated into Syriac. You mentioned Severus of Antioch mm. earlier. Um, what other genres that classicists would be familiar with are Syriac writers picking up and using? I mean, Christian or secular genres. So, I mean, what's the range here? Um, they translate a lot of classical works in the proper sense, to put it mm -hmm. this way. Already during the sixth century, there is a figure called Sergius of Resch Einer, who lived um, in Theodosiopolis in the east, again, of modern day Turkey. And he translated, for example, Aristotle into mm. Syriac. Um, there was also a translation of the Ace Agoge in, uh, by Porphyry, the anti-Christian author per mm -hmm. se, uh, made by Syriac authors. There are few, there are some treatises on logic and things like this um, by Syriac authors, but they mainly do the translation business, which was then very important in later centuries for the Arabic tradition. Mm -hmm. It continued in part Syriac traditions. So Syriac is also an important language that connected the Greek tradition, also the classical Greek tradition, with the Arabic word of the 8th and 9th century, Baghdad. Yes, um, and my understanding is that Syriac scholars were among the best uh, in that, that sort of transitional period between mm -hmm. like late antiquity, early Byzantium on the one hand, and the world of learning under the caliphate on the other, a few centuries mm -hmm. later, and that Syriac uh, 
scholars were part, very important part of that intermission mm -hmm. and in, in uh, you know, transmitting uh, ancient philosophical works you know, mm -hmm. to the, um, you know, later Arab centers of learning. And, and interestingly, so, at the same yeah. time, um, when Sergius writes, Boethius translates similar works, in part even the same works into Latin. And this shows a certain similarity of Latin and Syriac. Both of them bring those classical Greek texts um, to other regions beyond the borders of the Roman Empire. Yes, that's There's a, a good fascinating point. parallel between these two languages and these two figures. Yeah. Um, what about yeah. law? Yeah. Isn't there like a, isn't there a, a book of Roman law in Syriac? Yes, there is the Syriac Ro Roman Rechtsbuch, it's called in German. I think even Anglophone <laughs> authors use this expression Rechtsbuch, Book of Law, uh, which um, has some translations of classical works, but some adaptations too. So there are certain um, elements that much more rely on oral traditions than Roman law did at this time. So it's somehow, it's not an official law book, but something that was used in practical life. Mm -hmm. And we have some Byzantine parallels to that, only they're much later, like the uh, the farmer's law and the Rhodian sea law, which are mm -hmm. the same sort of thing. It's sort of a translation or adaptation of Roman law to local circumstances in Greek villages or uh, to uh, you know maritime trade um, mm -hmm. that the language is pretty simplified and it, it's adapted to local circumstances. And so I see those as sort of parallel processes, like sort of conveying Roman things and institutions and norms into Greek and into Syriac. In some cases, it happens first in the Syriac, in, in, in some cases in the Greek. And so it seems that Syriac speakers had developed the sort of, you know, textual you know, like libraries and terminology and vocabulary with which to be Romans in, mm -hmm. in the East. Uh, we're talking about law and historiography and um, you know, all, all of the genres of Christian writing, certainly like homilies and saints' lives and so on. And mm -hmm. I think it's in this connection that I, I just wanna draw attention to some of the phrases that you use in your article, where you, you call John, for example, to be a Roman historian who happened to write in Syriac or a Romano-Syriac historian and Later on, you call him uh, Syro Roman, which you kind of uh, calc on, on Greco Roman, which is a, mm -hmm. a, a yes. standard mm -hmm. phrase for us, but Syro Roman isn't. And so this is a possibility that intrigues me. Uh, I mentioned it earlier this kind of idea of being Roman in Syriac. And, and it seems that, you know, there was a movement in that direction. And who knows what might have happened had, you know, the those provinces remained part of the Roman Empire after the seventh century. I mean, the, the Syriac communities might have gone much further in that direction, and we would have had a kind of Byzantium in Syriac. I mean, this is mm -hmm. sort of, I'm sort of fantasizing here. Mm -hmm. But is, is that like a trajectory that you think was like possible? I have been trained in Berlin uh, in an atmosphere where we love contrafactual history oh, as okay. an intellectual game. And if yeah. we imagine that the Arabic expansion had not happened yes. during the seventh century and um, that the Eastern Roman Empire had lost the West more or less, then there would have been two main linguistic groups, the Greeks and the Syriac speakers, some Coptic speakers in, in Egypt. And there were intellectually, they became ever more on equal footing. And so I could imagine that there would have been some Greeks who started to learn Syriac in order to understand these people too. And that Syriac would have become ever more often used by the administration, by the governors, and so had become the second language of the empire. Mm. Perhaps besides Latin, but Latin could have lost in importance and Syriac had been, be, could have become the sister language of Greek in this sure. sense. Sure. Yes. Yeah. And and recently I read um, Fournay's book on the rise of Coptic, 
Mm -hmm. And I was fascinated that he he points to some parallel developments taking place in Coptic, but in the mm -hmm. late sixth century. So it's like taking a bit longer to get to that mm -hmm. point. But it seems that Coptic was being used for like official documentary purposes of, you know, wills, contracts, these kinds of things within the Roman legal framework. And, and again, those are just the kinds of possibilities that history tantalizes you with, but then you know, doesn't, uh, you know, follow through on. Um, so, okay, so I want to bring this to a close with a few more questions here about sort of big picture. Um, so what are the prospects for the integration of Syriac into the study of the Roman Empire? Uh, or what would your recommendations be for, like, if, if you could advise fields or uh, future scholars on how to work on this, um, this integration? Um, so what would you recommend? So first thing, I would recommend to learn more languages. Every German student of theology learns three languages. Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, whereas ancient historians uh, only learn Greek and Latin. Why shouldn't we learn a third language, such as Hebrew, such as Syriac, such as Coptic, to get a better idea of the world? It's very difficult to realize, but there are now some institutions that offer summer courses and so on. So I hope there will be more people who take the time to learn the, these languages. Mm -hmm. What has already been achieved, I think, by Peter Brown, his people, is that people have at least a bad conscience if they do not take the other languages in account and the source in the other languages in account. So a, there's a certain sensitivity. I think we should build on this. But in the end, given that the structures are as they are and as the time for studying is very limited, um, there will be few people will use the languages and I hope that they will be listened to. In Germany, we have an interesting group that now also is um, fascinated by Syria. These are students with an Islamic background. Mm -hmm. Islamic theology is taught at German universities and some universities offer, offer Syria courses for students of Islamic theology. And they know also Arabic this is a very different group of students who have their own questions, which can enrich our discussions enormously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if I could add a sort of halfway step toward what you were just, you know, presenting, at least use translations. Yes, <laughs> right? that's true. It's true. Yeah. If they are reliable. They, they might be, yeah. If you're, if you need to get really granular about what a text says yeah. and you don't know Syriac, ask someone who does. Yes. In most major universities, there will be someone around, or you know, mm -hmm. now we have the means to contact anybody. Yeah. But there's no excuse for not reading translated sources mm -hmm. from these languages. That's what the translations are for. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> yeah. This is true. Yes, you're right. I say this as someone who translates mm. Byzantine texts. That's mm. why I do it. Mm. Um, and and so you know, in, in in trying to flesh out life under the Roman Empire and all of its complexity and all the details, uh, use those resources. Um, there's no reason not to. Anyway, it's uh, the difference between z zero and one is infinite. <laughs> and then, right, the difference between one and three is just two. Um, okay. Uh, so any final thoughts uh, on this whole question? Yes. Um, we have spoken about Syriac as a historical language of late antiquity so far. Mm -hmm. We should remember that there are still people who live with and in the Syriac tradition. Many of them used to live in southeastern Turkey, northern Iraq, and a large group of them has been fled to Europe, to the US. There are migrants here. They are working here. And um, the tradition, their tradition can be lost. And I think doing research on Syriac is not only important for historical reasons, but also to preserve this important part of human heritage, which is incorporated in the Syriac texts and in the Syriac traditions.
Absolutely, I second that. Um, this is not just a matter of uh, historical research, you know, our mm. antiquarian interests in you know the fourth century or whatever. Uh, but this is a, a tradition that lasted much longer after the fall of the Roman Empire that survived uh, incredible historical changes over the millennia um, and whose descendants are still with us. And so insofar as we care about these historical traditions, uh, we should do our part to uh, preserve them. And one way to do that is study them and draw attention to them. Mm -hmm. And so um, hopefully, you know, our audience will now know a bit something a bit more about the Syriac language tradition and how it intersected with Roman studies and, and Byzantium. And uh, there, there are many translations. So you all go mm -hmm. out and read some of these texts. They're, they're quite interesting. Thank you so much, Hartmut. This is very enlightening. And Thank I you. look forward to reading about you know, prison literature or, or whatever else you write about. Thank you very much for your fascinating questions.